again, and welcome to Jason Live. My name is Patrick Shea, and we're back once again with our STEM career series, where we check out careers in science, technology, engineering, and math from role models currently working in those fields. Today's STEM role model is Kevin Lino. Uh, Kevin is a coral reef biologist with NOAA's Coral Reef Ecosystem Division. He spends his time monitoring the health of coral reefs all over Hawaii and uh, other U.S. territories in the Pacific. We're going to learn all about Kevin and his very cool career in just a moment. But before we do, I want to remind all of you out there that this event is both live and interactive. Just below the video player, you'll see a box where you can send us questions and participate in our polls. Kevin's looking forward to answering as many of your questions as possible. So uh, it's time to get him involved in the program. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks for joining us today. Aloha, Patrick. Aloha. Morning, Hawaii. You, you are coming for Hawaii, so uh, that is the appropriate greeting to start off with. So um, I want to start with your current career, your current role. Um, why don't you tell me what it is that you do, and uh, we'll, we'll get rolling. All right. Uh, my current role is a marine ecosystems research specialist for NOAA Fisheries. I work with the Coral Reef Ecosystems Division in Hawaii, and our job involves the assessment and monitoring of any U.S. Pacific territory, including all the Hawaiian islands, the Marianas Islands, American Samoa, and a lot of very small islands that are U.S. territories in the Pacific. And they're typically hard to get to, so we use ships to get there. And we spend a lot of our time in the water doing surveys and collecting data uh, so that we can assess the status of the coral reefs. So what's a, a typical day life in your role? I mean, you, you we're going to, I'm sure, talk a lot about the scuba diving element of it, but how much of what you do is in the water and how much is back in the lab or in the office? A good portion of our time is spent in the office preparing for these missions. There's a lot of logistics that have to happen in order to use the small boats, the scuba diving to make sure everyone's being as safe as possible and that we have all the equipment necessary to do these types of surveys. Uh, we have a lot of camera equipment and video equipment uh, we also want to train our people as uh, much as possible. We do fish. My primary role is doing fish surveys. So there's a lot of fish in the ocean, and a lot of these different regions have different species. So we need to know what's going to be there ahead of time. So I'd say about three quarters of my time is spent in the office, and about a quarter of the time is spent in the field actually doing these surveys. So let's talk more about the surveys. Talk me through the process. What are you looking for? What are the techniques that you use? Uh, there, there are three techniques that I actually utilize. There are the fish REA, there is the toad diver surveys, and um, we also have uh, some other water sampling and working diving that I also assist with. The fish REA surveys are where we put two divers into the water and they count and enumerate the fish that are in the area and we get an idea of what the benthic habitat also looks like by taking some photographs and uh, doing visual census work on that type of survey. The other survey that I spend a good portion of my time is a towed diver survey where I'm actually being towed behind a boat on a tow sled that you see in the photographs and we have two divers in the water one of them is looking at the fish and the other one is looking at the benthic habitat and we're taking video of the area as long as, as well as still shots so that we can later analyze those and see what the habitat looks like around a larger area the rea type surveys are more localized and we try to get as many random ones out as possible versus the tow surveys we're able to cover about two and a half kilometers per survey. So we're able to cover a very large area and see what's going on in these reef habitats. And then uh, other the oceanographic type surveys that I also assist with every now and again uh, are looking at what the water quality is, the subsurface uh, temperatures, and we have to uh, use lift bags and 
other types of equipment to get these instruments into the water and back out of the water so that we can get the data off of them. Cool. So I'd like to go back to the, the tow survey because this is a technique that I, I would suspect that a lot of our viewers aren't familiar with. And you were telling me the other day about kind of, you know, what all the gear is that you have access to while you're being towed in the water. So why don't you talk us through what we're, we're, what we're seeing here. Uh, this is you being towed. What is on yes. your, your platter there? That's probably not the right term for it, but wh <laughs> what are we looking at? Uh, that's me on a tow board. And the other tow diver, of course, is taking the photograph. And what you see is that on the board itself, there on my, the, to the left of my arm, is what's known as a subsurface temperature recorder. So it's recording the temperature and the pressure. And from the pressure, we're able to figure out what the exact depth is while I'm doing a survey. And directly in, in the center of the board is a data sheet. So anytime I'm seeing a large fish, uh, what we consider large is anything over 50 centimeters. Uh, so those are the large mobile type fish. Uh, which this survey method is really good at collecting information on sharks and jacks and things like that. Uh, I'm able to take a visual census and record the size, species, and numbers that we're seeing in an area. Uh, also on my board are dive computers and, wa and various watches uh, so that I can look directly at my board and know my depth, know the time underwater, uh, and also know how long each transect is and they run about five minutes each before I move to the next one and we check in with the boat by a telegraph cable that's also attached to the board and we use Morse code uh, with our own developed uh, signals to let the boat drivers know what's going on so they hear a beeping on the boat every five minutes that I'm sending up a signal that says hey we're okay or speed up a little bit, slow down, maybe move the boat further to the left or to the right. Uh, and and if, if there ever was an emergency, we'd be able to relay to that or that information to them as well. On the bottom of the tow board, which you can't see in that photograph, is a camcorder that's recording uh, any fish or strange activities that we might be seeing. So if there's a crown of thorns outbreak or an algal outbreak in a small area, we'll have that video documentation along with our visual census that we've written down as well. Cool. We're starting to get uh, live questions coming in. So we're going to take our first one here. This is from Daisy. She wants to know how many people in your group dive with you. Uh, on our ships, we have about 21 to 22 uh, divers that go out. We launch about five or six small boats, and we have teams broken up into whether they're doing benthic surveys like this team and they're doing water collection or my team uh, or tow team we have a four person team so I have two people in the water and two people on the surface and we just swap back and forth all day long maximizing the amount of surveys we can do and then the REA teams uh, the fish survey team can have you know five or six people and they work in pairs of two there's always at least two divers in the water for safety and then there's also another team that is putting in instruments in the bottom, and they have about six people. So we have about 22 people out in the field uh, diving regularly, and we get a lot of dives in. We, during one day, there's probably about 70 dives being conducted by those 20 people. That's pretty amazing. Uh, we've got another question here from Michelle. She wants to know how have climate changes affected your work? Well, that's a great question, and that's one reason why we're out doing what we do. We know that climate change is definitely going to have an impact and has impacts on the coral reef environment. And while we're out there, we are collecting the data and information for managers to be able to see what's going on in different regions, uh, to be able to track these trends over time to document this. Personally, I've been able to see areas that are affected by major shifts in uh, water temperature, whether it's uh, a La Nina year, which is a, a, a natural fluctuation in current, or climate change, I've seen some coral bleaching happen. And then when I return to the same location two years later, that the reefs are starting to recover from that event. Um, so we actually can see it a little bit, um, but most of the time it's such a gradual change 
that we're just trying to track it over time and be able to document that. We've got a related question here from Missy. She wants to know, what's the major reason, reason for the death and bleaching of coral reefs? Well, that is also a very good question, and that's why we have benthic and coral specialists that are out there with us. I specialize mostly with the fish surveys and seeing what fish are in the different regions. Uh, our benthic people are looking at the coral and the coral disease and trying to track and find out what's going on. There are a lot of different causes that could lead to it, and we have a lot of different areas that we survey. So there's um, human impacts that can have an effect, so runoff. Uh, from rivers and other types of pollution that are going on. Climate change, of course, can also have an impact. So if the water is warming, uh, it takes coral reefs some time to adjust to that. And some species aren't able to adjust. There can be impacts uh, where we'll have algal blooms or other types of water quality issues which are affecting the reefs as well. So our benthic guys are out there really trying to track this. And they're also... Uh, looking at possible new diseases that could be arising in some of the areas that we're going to because they we get to go to areas where there are very little human impacts and then we get to do the comparison between the two uh, to see what's going on cool we've got tons of questions coming in so i'm kind of going to start doing a little rapid fire here this one's from brooke is there any fish you've encountered that are rare i have there's many different species that are pretty rare and uh, with our studying ahead of time to know what fish are in each region we kind of have an idea and we're looking for those types of species and anything that's outside the norm is really easy for us to pick out uh, in hawaii in general we go to the northwest hawaiian islands and there's a whiskered armor head that's up there that's pretty rare and I've gotten to see those before. They have some at the Waikiki Aquarium and I'm sure some other aquariums on the mainland as well. Uh, they're pretty unique looking fish. Um, one of my more favorite fish is uh, called a Playtax tiara. It's a type of spade fish. They're not super uncommon but to see them in really large numbers is pretty rare. So we actually had some good video of them where they're a very inquisitive fish and we actually nicknamed all of them Steve. Uh, so every time now we go out and uh, we get to see these guys, we kind of have a little bit more of, they have more of a personality to them. So we look forward to seeing them. Uh, and so this is a very inquisitive school, which we don't see very often. Typically most fish are, are trying to avoid divers. Uh, for whatever reason, this school of Steve's really wanted to hang out with us. Uh, and some of the more Attractive fish also stand out, so things like butterfly fish or uh, angel fish, we'll see those every now and again, too. One of the uh, hot topics whenever we chat with people who do things underwater is, you know, the danger component, and we're starting to get a bunch of questions related to that. We have a couple here. This one's from Carissa. Do you sometimes have dangerous encounters while you're working in the ocean? And then... Addison wants to know, has there ever been an emergency when you were diving? Um, both very good questions. And that is one reason why we spend a lot of our time training, uh, preparing ourselves for almost every scenario. There are things that will arise that you can't be prepared for, but we spend a lot of time training, making sure that everyone's healthy and safe and has prepared all of our equipments, the best equipment possible, and that it's ready to go for when we are in the field. Uh, there are some scenarios with the tow board uh, where we're being towed and there can be really strong currents or down currents. Uh, and so you have to be able to adjust for that. And we train our people ahead of time so that they're ready and prepared for that. And they have to be diving with us for a year and meet a bunch of requirements and have a lot of boating skills before they're allowed to do that type of survey. And we also have, uh, I think the big question everyone's probably worried about is sharks or other large things underwater that um, could be scary. And it's actually one of my favorite parts of my job is that I really like to um, see as many sharks as possible. That's why the tow survey is really valuable because sharks are actually pretty scared and intimidated of divers most time. They don't like the noise and bubbles that we make. And so they try to avoid us. But with the tow diver, we're moving and we're able to cover large areas 
And so oftentimes we can, you know, surprise them a little bit, or they might be a little bit more curious as what we are. Uh, so I'm actually very interested in seeing those sharks and not uh, too worried at, uh, at seeing them at all. I've seen tiger sharks, uh, hammerhead sharks, a couple different species of those. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to see some whale sharks, uh, large manta rays, and typically we're not too afraid of those species. And we know that we're not a food source for them. Uh, they're just typically curious of us. And it's actually usually pretty hard to see them. They try to avoid us fairly often. Well, thanks for uh, going ahead and answering Jasmine's question. You might have seen that <laughs> pop up as you were talking about sharks. She wanted to know what you do if there were. So thanks for asking that question. Raya wants to know, what do you do with the information you gather, and how does that help us? Uh, so all the information we gather is looking at an ecosystem's approach to what's going on at each one of these reefs. So we're looking at the fish, but then we also have the benthic side. And so we're trying to put everything, put everything together into an ecosystem's view of what's going on in these areas. And we'll do some basic analysis of that data. And our data, since we work for NOAA Fisheries, is open um, for requests and for other researchers that might have specific questions about you know, one type of species or one um, exact kind of location or a watershed or things along that line. And all of our data is also turned over to the managers of all these regions. Um, so they're actually the ones that have the information that we've done some analysis for. So we can say, this is what we're seeing. And so they can make those types of calls. Um, is for one instance, in American Samoa, we turn a lot of our all of our data over there. And they've seen that there's certain species of fish that aren't um, that are fairly rare and are considered vulnerable. And so they put f fishing restrictions out based on some of that data. So we aren't actually making any of the decisions. We're just turning the information over and letting the managers use that information. Makes sense. Um, we're about halfway through here, so we're going to keep on moving. And, and we're actually going to shift gears and talk about how you got into this career. Uh, what was your career path? And Erin has a question that's going to launch us into that. She wants to know, what did you want to be when you were a kid? Um, I was very fortunate that I had a very outdoorsy family. And my dad took us out fishing and on a boat all the time. Um, he still takes my nephews and his grandkids out all the time as well. Um, I grew up in Pennsylvania, so I had a lake and some rivers and uh, some ponds and things along that, uh, that line. But I was always outside and I was fascinated by Jacques Cousteau documentaries. Um, the, the Shark Week, when it first started, it was all about the researchers out doing it and it wasn't all about Air Jaws. And so that really excited me and uh, got me interested in that type of a field. Um, my grandmother also had been to Hawaii several times when she was younger, and that was a big inspiration for me to get out here. And so I was really glad to be able to do that. Uh, and what I really wanted to be when I was little, I wanted to be Jacques Cousteau, and I wanted to swim with sharks. Okay, our next question here is from Julia. She wants to know, what made you start scuba diving? Uh, also, I wanted to scuba dive when I was really young, ever since uh, my Jacques Cousteau wannabe days. And it was really hard to do in Pennsylvania. There weren't a lot of areas to do that. Luckily, when I was in uh, college, that there were some programs that were offered, and I was able to do it through my school at lower cost. And after I did that and spent some time in the field uh, actually diving on coral reefs, I fell in love and never turned back. Um, my first couple dives were in Florida and uh, it took me a little while to get used to it and now being underwater is just my second home and I feel really comfortable and absolutely love being able to scuba dive for a career. All right well we've been asking Kevin a lot of questions and now it's time to turn around and he has some questions for you in poll format. Um, so we're going to jump to those right now. His first poll question is, where did Kevin first scuba dive with a shark? 
and I'm glad we didn't just give that away when we were talking about <laughs> when you started scuba diving. Is it A, in Hawaii? Is it B, Pennsylvania? C, Florida? Or D, Australia? So enter your guess there. We're going to check out the answers as they come in. But uh, So, Kevin, it looks like 50%, uh, over 50% right now are guessing Hawaii Everything else is pretty low. Florida's got about a third of the vote at the moment. Why don't you tell us what the right answer is? Uh, the right answer is actually Florida. Uh, I had a dive master that was able to take us down to Florida, and I got to see a nurse shark on my second dive. And it swam around us a couple times, and that was my first dive with a shark. And since then, I've been able to dive with probably about 20 to 25 different species of shark. Very cool. Let's go to our second poll question here. What job did Kevin have that utilized boats, helicopters, and ATVs, all-terrain vehicles? Was it A, as a biological observer? Was it B, as a marine debris technician? C, as an archivist? Or D, as an international spy? So uh, we're going to give you a sec to think about that one. The answer, I believe, was actually in Kevin's profile. If you read through those uh, questions and answers before the event, you'll probably know the answer to this. Uh, we've got an even mix uh, between biological observer, marine debris technician, and international spies actually getting about 20% <laughs> of the answers here. Uh, in the lead, though, marine debris technician has 50%. What's the right answer, Kevin? That is correct, marine debris technician. As much as I would like to be an international spy, <laughs> it is uh, my one of my first jobs in Hawaii was being a marine debris technician, and we removed derelict fishing gear from coastlines and remote islands in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands via boats. Uh, one of our projects in the main Hawaiian Islands let us use ATVs, uh, and here you see us being towed while snorkeling, and we're looking for marine debris. And when we find it, we mark it, take some information on it, and then uh, diver, we free dive down and tie lines off to it, and we're able to pull it out. Um, we also, trying to find it in the main Hawaiian Islands, we used helicopters to look for it visually along all the coastlines. And we got to use all three of the techniques, and I got the best of all three worlds and a lot of really great training and experience to do so while helping make the environment a better place and cleaning out some entanglement hazards for the muck seals and birds and turtles to no longer need to avoid. Well, I was going to ask because that sounds like you know, a really ambitious project. It must be very important to, to get that stuff out of the ecosystem. Yes, absolutely. Um, not only just for the charismatic megafauna that could become entangled or lose its life, which has happened. Uh, it also, the nets will tangle up on reefs, and as the waves continue washing it, it just tears coral and uh, just drags across the reef, and you'll get reef scars and some damage uh, to the reefs that way. So uh, we'll carefully cut it off the reef as best we can and try to get it out of that environment. And then it's brought back to Hawaii where it is uh, recycled via partners and actually used for uh, fuel and electricity. Cool. We're going to move right ahead to our third poll question. This one is, where was Kevin shipwrecked? Is it the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, Samoa, Virginia, or the Philippines? Uh, this is another one that I believe Kevin talked about in his Q&A, so you might have a lead on that. Let's see what the answers are coming in. Uh, Northwest Hawaiian Islands has 70% of the vote at the moment. Those numbers are still changing, but that looks like it's going to stay in the lead. Kevin, what do you say? That is correct. It's, it was the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. So we actually have a, uh, a video question that came in from our students, and, and they're really interested. I'm, in I'm Ethan, and I'm Nathan, and we're from Turner Elementary School, Maine. We had a few questions about your shipwreck in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. How long were you in, up in the deserted island? How did you survive? And do you still have contact with the people you were shipwrecked with? So not sure if you were able to hear that, but they want to know how long you were there, how did you survive, and are you still in contact with the people that you were with? 
All great questions. Uh, it was in 2005 while I was doing marine debris uh, removal and our ship had run aground and it happened in the middle of the night and we were able to launch all of our small boats uh, before we lost power and we were at Pearl and Hermes in the Northwest One Islands, which is fairly remote. And another vessel was actually contacted uh, before we fully abandoned ship. We were on the vessel for about 18 hours, and then we got all into our small boats and made our way into the atoll where there was a little sand island with, with nothing on it except for a little bit of grass and some coral rubble. And we made makeshift tents out of tarps that we had brought and the oars out of the boats and we had to spend the night there. And then the following day, we drove to another small island where there happened to be a field camp that, had a, that was a little bit better supplied with tents and other things, and spent the day there until the ship actually came that evening and was able to pick us up. Uh, they then took us to another location midway that has an airport, which the Coast Guard arrived and was able to fly us back home to Hawaii. Uh, several of those people are actually really good friends of mine that we went through that experience. Uh, several of them still work with me and I get to see them every day and we're really close. There was about 16 of us as the marine debris team and every year around that same date a good portion of us will still get together and talk about it. Very cool. What an adventure. Uh, we're going to keep on moving with the poll questions. This next one, what is the state fish of Hawaii? And this is a fish that uh, Kevin must see in his counts when he's out there doing f surveys, is it A, the mahi-mahi? Is it B, the ono? Is it C, the yulila? And Kevin can tell me if I've pronounced that one right. Uh, or is it D, the humu humu nuku nuku ahupa? Apua'a. I knew I was gonna have a tough time with that. So, uh, Kevin, not what do you bad. think? Not too bad at all. We're gonna take a, we're gonna do a video hint here. This is the state fish of Hawaii, but do you know its name? Uh, we've got about half of the folks out there saying mahi mahi, and the other half are saying the humu humu. Um, Kevin, what are we looking at here? Uh, humu humu. There you and go. And it's definitely a fish we see in Hawaii when we do our surveys. Can you give us the full name and actually say it right? Because I botched it. Uh, humu humu nuku nuku apua. There you go. All right, so our last poll question for the day. I'm going to bring it up here. True or false, scuba divers do not need to know much math or science. This sounds like a trick question for me. Is it A, true, or B, false? We're going to have to get through this one pretty quickly. We'll see what the answers are. We've got right off the bat, 85% of our viewers out there are saying false. So, Kevin... Do you That's need to know correct. a lot of math and science? Math and science are actually very important to be a scuba diver. They're, uh, to avoid those risks that people had asked questions about earlier, you need to know a lot of different um, physics and laws and math, uh, be able to uh, know the pressures. We dive with mixed type gases, so we use nitrox a good portion of our time. Um, and you need to be very knowledgeable of all that information before you ever even get to get into the water. We are going to get back to the questions right now. And we have a question from Jasmine that kind of picks up on what you were just talking about there. She wants to know how physically prepared do you have to be to do your job? Uh, a good portion of us, especially the toe divers, it can be very physically demanding. Diving in general is actually very physically demanding. Uh, we try to make sure that everyone goes through physicals each year to make sure that they're keeping up on their own. Uh, a lot of us ha are very outdoorsy people that spend a lot of time doing physical activities. A lot of our hobbies involve being in the water or swimming or other things. Uh, several of my colleagues were at a rescue swimmer course uh, just yesterday. Uh, just going through a lot of different types of training to get ourselves as physically fit as possible for these long durations out at sea and a lot of time underwater. Well, I'm glad you bring that up because, um, you know, one of the things we wanted to talk to you about today was some of your, your personal hobbies and the things that you like to do when you're not working. Um, why don't you tell us about a few of those? We've, we've got a shot of you here scaling uh, 
a cliff. <laughs> is this um, one of the ways you stay in shape? This is in Hawaii that's uh, doing some rock climbing. Uh, it's one of you know my pastimes that I like to do. Don't get to do too much of it, but this is a beautiful location uh, that a friend was able to get a good shot of us while we were out there climbing. Uh, I also do a lot of outrigger canoe racing. In Hawaii, uh, we call it refer to it as paddling. Uh, there's an, this is a six-man canoe, and this is crossing uh, the channel from Molokai back to Oahu during a race. Uh, and I do that a good portion of the time. I also have a one-man canoe that I like to take out for fun and uh, to enjoy. Uh, of course, it's Hawaii, so we do a lot of surfing out here. And like I said, we do a lot of swimming and free diving. Uh, I spend a good portion of my time uh, hiking and running and trail running. Uh, I have a dog, and uh, my girlfriend's also a very active trail runner, so I try to keep up with those two when I can. Uh, I also play soccer probably three or four times a week as well. And how do you have time to do all of it is the amazing question. Um, we've got another question coming in now. Uh, this one is from Samantha. There it is. Would you recommend this job to others and why? Uh, actually, I have recommended uh, this job to a lot of other people, especially the marine debris position. Uh, for people just getting into this type of marine science career, if they would like to have a lot of field time and to see what it's like, both the ups and downs, because the weather isn't always the best. Uh, it can be physically demanding, but yet you get to see beautiful places and do something rewarding. Um, my job as well, currently as a marine ecosystems research specialist, I have several friends that have similar careers and uh, a couple of them now work with me and a lot of the people I work with are really great friends. And I definitely would recommend this job for people that are very passionate about the environment that would like to make a difference and who are also very active and uh, have the background or the interest to pursue a marine biology career working with coral reefs. We are almost out of time, but we've got a little time for one last question here. This one's from Sophie. She wants to know, what's the favorite part of your job? Uh, there are a lot of good parts to it. I would say when I'm tow boarding, uh, because I'm being pulled through the water, so I actually don't have to swim. So it's power diving. So all I have to do is hold on a little bit and just being able to see everything that's coming past me and that's hanging off, off the reef, uh, especially the moments when I get to swim and dive with sharks. Uh, they're one of my favorite creatures and they're amazing and very elegant underwater. So it's a really great moment when I get to spend time with them. And I'm not sure if we got a chance to play this earlier, but this is what it actually looks like while you're being towed through the water, doing your survey. Um, and according to Kevin, one of the favorite parts of his job. It looks really peaceful and, and uh, pretty amazing. So Kevin, uh, unfortunately, that is all the time we have with you today. Thanks so much for joining us and answering our questions and potentially inspiring the next generation of coral reef biologists. It was my pleasure. And good luck to everyone out there. Awesome. We hope. Uh, Kevin was able to join us today thanks to the NOAA Coral Reef Conservation Program's Reef Smart Initiative. It's designed to increase awareness of NOAA's coral reef ecosystem research and conservation efforts. To learn more about Reef Smart, go to coastalscience.noaa.gov slash projects. Um, also coming to you by way of Reef Smart, is next week's STEM role model, Roberto Venegas. Uh, he's an oceanographer. He's one of Kevin's colleagues. Uh, and he will be live with us on Thursday, November 14th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. That, again, is all the time we have for Jason Live. My name is Patrick Shea. We'll see you next time. Take care.